Greetings. Uh, welcome back. Um, this is Paul's first missionary journey as we move on in our discussion of archaeology and biblical interpretation. Some of the important sources that you might look at if you're interested in the way Paul has and his missionary journeys have been viewed uh, in detail would be uh, William Ramsey. William Ramsey has uh, a series of books um, that deal with Asia Minor in particular, what today would be Turkey. But uh, Paul the Traveler and Roman Citizen, the cities of Paul and the geography of Asia Minor, as well as his historical commentary on St. Paul and many others. So I would recommend him to you if you are interested, especially in Paul and uh, how the historical archaeological work. Now, his work is somewhat dated because it is old, but um, he has a lot of valuable, valuable information in there. Paul is born in what today would be Turkey, in, uh, in Tarsus, which is um, in the southern coastal areas of uh, Turkey. Um, and you can read about that in Acts 22. Um, it was an intellectual center of the world. It was a center of philosophy of the Stoics and so forth. Here you see uh, some of the remains pictured. Uh, Strabo mentions Tarsus as well. I'll let you read that on your own. Uh, Tarsus uh, is located near the Cilician Gates. This is a mountain pass through the, uh, through the mountains. Uh, Turkey uh, is ringed, or Asia Minor is ringed with uh, mountains around it with a central plateau. There is one good mountain pass. Uh, I've been through that mountain pass. It's pretty impressive. It's called the Cilician Gates and leads to Cilicia. And at the base of that, uh, not far from where it meets the coast, is Tarsus. So that makes it uh, very important. Transport north-south as well as east-west. We know that Paul is a citizen of this city. Uh, it appears he was sent to Jerusalem at an early, early age for his um, education. Uh, what you can see here is the uh, ruins in the city of Tarsus of the Roman wall and a gate that's there. Uh, I'll let you read these on your own, where he says he's from uh, Tarsus in Acts 21, 22, and 9. Um, Paul then, uh, as we know, uh, is traveling. He persecutes the church uh, eventually, but uh, he, he is first trained by Rabbi Gamaliel, um, who is well known in Jewish literature. You can find out a lot more information about him if you like. Um, probably not a lot of interaction with Greco-Roman culture until his conversion and his return to Tarsus. Uh, at any rate, he spends eight or nine years in Tarsus before his first missionary journey. Remember, he is uh, persecuting Christians as Saul, as he encounters Christ on the road to Damascus. In Damascus, he is uh, converted, baptized, and then um, there is... Um, I mentioned in Galatians where he spends three years uh, in the wilderness. Many people believe he was trained during those three years, much like the apostle, the other apostles were trained. And then he returns to his hometown of Tarsus. This is probably where he uh, is introduced to a lot of the Greco-Roman culture of his hometown. Uh, he also probably passes through Tarsus on uh, the missionary journeys, certainly the second and the third, it would seem likely. It's a large city today of almost 200,000 people. I put up here a chronology for you. I won't go through all of this. Um, the chronology of Paul, of course, tells us a lot about the chronology of the New Testament. There is some debate on it. I put up a um, what I think is a likely uh, good starting point for his uh, conversion, his years in Arabia, where uh, he is trained, probably three years, his trip uh, to Jerusalem, 37, uh, his years in Tarsus and in Antioch, uh, his second visit to Jerusalem, the first missionary journey, the conference uh, in Jerusalem, Acts 15, 51, uh, and so on. His arrest in Jerusalem, his prisoner in Rome, Paul is released. Then between 63 and 67, uh, many people would place a fourth, what some people call a fourth missionary journey, or 
Paul's uh, visit to Spain, of which there is a lot of traditional evidence, but not biblical uh, evidence. Here is a map that shows where Tarsus is, Cilician Gates. You see the coastal area is here. Uh, so I've traveled all over this area, uh, Espendos, Perga, Lystra, Antioch, um, and uh, Turkey is really a, um, a good uh, place to understand the New Testament. So I, I recommend you visiting there. In fact, I often take students on trips there. I'm planning on it uh, in the upcoming future. So if you're interested in that, let me know. Here is uh, Tarsus, part of the paving stones. Um, as you look at that, you can see the gutters here in the paving stone. Here's they've excavated down to the, the road level. Uh, here's another view with a colonnade. And this is the so-called uh, Cleopatra's Gate that I showed you earlier. Uh, it dates to the 2nd century, so not there probably during the time of Paul. Uh, maybe a gate, but not this one. And uh, certainly not there during the time of Cleopatra. Here's part of the Roman road uh, north of Tarsus. This dates also to uh, Septimus Severus, so this is uh, post-Paul, post-Pauline, post-first century. But the road would have followed a similar path, and uh, uh, Romans didn't change the routes of the roads much. Well, Damascus is another city where Paul, and we looked at Tarsus now, Damascus, uh, 130 miles north of Jerusalem, uh, the oldest uh, continuously occupied city in the world. Uh, Paul is converted here. Paul remains here uh, for a short while. He leaves during the reign of Eratas IV, who is a Nabataean king. Damascus is one of the Decapolis cities. It comes under Roman control in 64 BC when the Decapolis is formed. And here is an old map uh, giving us an idea of Damascus. Uh, here is, uh, Damascus is along important trade routes. One route that runs uh, out to the coast uh, from here through Palestine, uh, the Mediterranean, also a north-south uh, route through Damascus up and down through what today would be Jordan and Syria up to Turkey. And then, of course, a uh, east-west, um, you can move further east out to Mesopotamia from here. Had a very wide road at the time called the street called Strait, 50 feet wide. This is in fact the uh, the area in the wall at in Damascus where they say Paul was lowered down the wall. So here's a depiction. This is from the uh, church of Ananias which I visited and these illustrations were on the wall there. Uh, give you the idea of Paul uh, being blinded on the light. Uh, here's the entrance to the so-called street called Straight. And the street called Straight uh, would have been um, much wider than this because what's in fact happened is it was a very wide street and it's been encroached upon in intervening centuries with new building. So here's the church of Ananias and where these illustrations are taken from. They show Ananias touching Paul, scales falling from his eyes. Here's a courtyard. You would enter and go down this way. It's actually subterranean now because the... Uh, Roman levels are much lower. But this is in Damascus, just to the right inside the street called the gate to the street called Straight. So here you go down the stairs, see people seated. This is the uh, chapel uh, of Ananias. And as I said, this is the chapel of St. Paul. It says that it's built on the spot where Paul, remember, was lowered down the wall in a basket. And here's the depiction of that is extreme sport. People like extreme sports these days. Well, um, his first missionary journey then, um, Paul uh, heads up this way. You can see it on, on the line here. He, he goes out of Antioch. He starts there. He goes to Cyprus. Cyprus is the large island out here, sort of shaped like a pork chop. Uh, he lands at Salamis, goes to Paphos, heads up, uh, lands in Western Turkey comes up through Antioch and down through Derby. So here is another uh, map that shows Tarsus, Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Pisidian, Antioch. Pisidian Antioch um, is uh, near some mountains, uh, boundary of the Anatolian Plateau. Remember, I told you there's mountains all the way around uh, Turkey, and uh, quite high, 4,000 feet. 
Um, 5,280 is a mile, so it's not quite a mile, but it's pretty imposing uh, nonetheless. Because remember the elevation of it, if, if you think of a place like Denver is a mile high city, when you get there it doesn't seem too imposing because you've been gradually going up over many, many miles uh, to get up to that level. But for uh, here in Turkey, you start at sea level and you rise up over 4,000 feet in just, um, you know, uh, over, say, 20 miles, 30 miles. So, I mean, you're, you're rapidly climbing. Uh, the, so the, the uh, change in elevation is, seems much greater because it is over a shorter distance. At any rate, the roads go past this site uh, to Laodicea. Paul and Barnabas visit here, Acts 13 and 14. They're traveling by foot. From Perga, that would be about 155 miles. This is one of the things that we can learn uh, as I've traveled and visited a lot of the sites where Paul lived. Uh, they've gotten a real appreciation for his stamina, uh, for his uh, commitment. Um, it's a long road, dusty road that Paul would often travel. Um, probably went here on the advice of uh, Sergius Paulus, um, who is uh, down at Cyprus, the proconsul. And this was his hometown. Here you can see an inscription uh, mentioning his name in the city. So probably uh, this is why Paul ends up here. He preaches in the synagogue. And this, this is the pattern we see Paul doing. He goes first to the Jews. He goes to the synagogue. And uh, normally uh, some, some will be convinced or some will want more information. And uh, then he will uh, take it, his message elsewhere. But this is his pattern. Paul goes to cities, he goes to the synagogue, and he takes it to, to others. Uh, he goes into Galatia. Uh, Galatia, uh, you know, a lot of speculation, where was Galatia, I guess. Uh, but you know, it seems pretty reasonable to me that this was in the south, not in the north. Um, Paul and Barnabas uh, leave the town because of opposition and uh, probably come back here on both the second and the third journeys. And of course, later on, he writes a, a, a letter, an epistle. To, to the Galatians. Here's more of Pisidian Antioch. This site has just been ex, uh, excavated a, a great, great deal during the 1990s and into the, uh, even in the early 2000s, and it's been extensively excavated. So there's all kinds of remains here now uh, that, that are visible. There's all kinds of remains there, uh, but uh, now they've been exposed. Um, you can see a uh, theater, you can see a temple to Augustus, uh, and so forth. This is part of a bathhouse that's there. And in the distance, you can see those imposing mountains. Still see some of the snow up there. And part of an aqueduct. Can you see the aqueduct here? Uh, the Romans, uh, as we've already talked about, uh, one of their greatest achievements is the delivery of water to their cities. And aqueducts coming from the mountains like this have given us a great uh, water supply. Here's some of the towers uh, along the, uh, the streets. And of course, this had a long occupation, Hellenistic Romans, certainly Byzantine as well. Uh, some more of the uh, area's shops would have been along here, along the uh, streets and the walls. Uh, here is the gate area. Uh, people entering. This stuff's been recently excavated along here, showing, uh, exposing the expanse of this road. And here you can see the road. You can just see how uh, this would have been where the sewage would have run down through, and that's partially why it's collapsed. You can also see the uh, ruts here where wagons uh, would have been making their way up this, this slope. The Cardo Maximus means the, Cardo means heart. Uh, Maximus means great, the great heart or the great heart road or central road of the city. Here's part of the theater, estimated would hold 5,000 people, 26 rows of seats. Certainly would have been in existence when Paul Barnes was there. Another view of the theater, some people there for scale. Uh, some of the structures along the streets, these would have been shops, shops along the streets. Uh, as you passed by to see the goods that were there. And this uh, area in Great Ruins was once the temple to Augustus. Uh, the, the worship of emperors was um, took place in the Roman Empire. Uh, many emperors were deified 
the temple uh, Augustus was deified eventually. But in the east, we see that they, um, the active worship of emperors before they were deceased will also take place. But emperor worship was very popular in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. Um, so that ends this uh, discussion for now. I hope you uh, have a good day.